Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Rachel Seltzer Quirico. Hello, TwitchCon. It's so lovely to see you, TwitchCon. And as our very first TwitchCon winds down here in San Francisco, we wanted to bring you something very special from the stage. I believe uh, DJ Wheat told you a little story earlier about the Twitch CEO, Emmett Shear, and his passion for Hearthstone. Emmett considers himself one of the greatest Hearthstone players of all time. So we thought it appropriate to bring some of the greatest Hearthstone players of all time around to teach him a thing or two. And then we thought we'd set him up in a battle. And that battle we decided to find a challenger, and that challenger is none other than the CEO and president of Blizzard, Mike Morheim. So please welcome to the stage for our CEO battle, Emmett Shear, CEO of Twitch, and Mike Morheim, CEO and president of Blizzard. I'll join you gentlemen up here. Now this, Emmett, Mike, is a serious esports competition. And so in the style of many esports competitions that have come before, I have to ask you, as opponents for each other, what brings you here to this stage? What does competing in Hearthstone mean to you, Emmett? I've been playing Hearthstone uh, since the beta, and the opportunity to come here and compete in front of this huge audience uh, is my opportunity to finally show the deep level of commitment I have to being a master of this game. Now, Mike, in Emmett, you have not only a passionate fan, but a fierce opponent. What does it mean to face off against someone with such a love for one of your games? Well, I've been playing Hearthstone even longer than Beta. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I, I can't let uh, Emmett win this match. <laughs> well then, do you have any words for your opponent, Mike? Uh, I wish you the best of luck. That's very, very kind of you, Mike. Emmett, do you have any words for your opponent? Uh, I wish you the best of luck, too. You're going to need it. All right, the final stage gentlemen please take your seats and crowd please help me welcome to the stage the casters for the show none other than Frodan, Raynad, and Kriparian. I'm gonna leave you guys in their very capable hands good luck gentlemen What's up, TwitchCon 2015? We're, we're live here from San Francisco in the Cap Theater, getting ready for Mike Morheim versus Emmett Shear. I'm joined by Raynad and Kriparian. I've always wanted to ask you, Crip, how's it going? Uh, it's <laughs> going pretty good. <laughs> Meme-tastic as always. Yeah. Raynad, how's your TwitchCon experience been so far? It's been good. It's been good. Busy, the, busy today, you know, meet and greet, casting this. Just, it's cool seeing everyone who, you know, you interact with in Twitch in a more real person-to-person, -person, non dank meme way. So, well, I'm pretty uh, sure that dank memes are plentiful and yeah. will continue to be so because we're going to have a great best of five here. Uh, we're going to be playing a tavern brawl and this one, Crip, you were saying, is one of the most exciting ones because it's a very complicated one if you yeah. enter it for the first time. Yeah, I was surprised they were going to go with this tavern brawl. It seems like, you know, tavern brawls, like whatever, it's kind of fun. It's maybe a not so competitive type of uh, mm -hmm. format, but uh, in this particular play, uh, in this particular case, it's going to be, I think it's Battle of the Underdogs, I think it's titled. That's right. Where the the player who's losing by more than three life at the start of their turn gets a random two or a three drop creature. And there is a crazy amount of strategy that is involved in winning this type of brawl because you want to be this underdog, but you also can only win with burst because you have to be behind, you have to push for the lead. So 
the amount of play that has to do with setting up the situation and continuing a win situation is extremely complex. I think much more so than the actual game. So yeah. we're, we're really putting the pressure down on these CEOs today. Maybe they're used to it. Yeah, well, uh, it's going to be really difficult to see how much they want to win by, right? If you're too far ahead, you give your opponent some minions, and then at the same time, you're, making, you're starting to lose because you're behind on board. It's very interesting. Now, we do have also some twists. Uh, we do have some coaching available, Raynad. Uh, it's not from you. It's through a special guest. Who's it going to be? It's going to be Trump. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Trump SC. Some people wearing Trump W shirts. I see you. Good job, dude. Trump here is going to be weaving in throughout the series, uh, being able to offer coaching to players who are losing Tavern Brawl. Because the way Tavern Brawl works is you get one deck, uh, and you do edit it every single time you go before the match. Uh, how is it actually going to work with uh, the, the sequencing of Trump being able to coach? Because he can technically coach both players. Uh, yeah, I, don't th I think Trump is a fairly impartial player. Um, I think he's just going to do his best to help out the loser. Uh, I think in this Tavern Brawl that, uh, well, at least I'm hoping that maybe they're playing Warlock. That seems to be like a pretty dominant class. But there are some others that have shown pretty, uh, pretty good performances as well, like Freeze Mage and some of the other classes. So we'll have to see if they bring a, a standard or more experimental approach to this. What's the first thing that jumps out in your mind right now when you hear about this <clears throat> format? I know a lot of people look at Warlock, but is there any other sleeper, yeah. best class in the game? Well, Minted <laughs> well, first thing that comes to my mind is that Warlock will be popular, so I want to lean towards something that's not Warlock, something like maybe Hunter to punish somebody for getting too low, maybe try Priest to manipulate their life total, you know, heal them yep. a lot. Um, I'm sure that there's actually a lot of depth and strategy and matchups playing a format like this, but uh, it's just going to be cool to see like what level uh, you know, the players are thinking on. All right, well, I believe we do have our first game that's about to start. It is Warlock versus Warlock. Let's go ahead and hop into the match. Now, we do see a little bit of interesting choices. The Zombie Chow heals your opponent, and therefore yep. the gap is closed by that card. Yeah, the Zombie Chow and Flame Imp, and just going first, are three of the major factors in this game. You want to be the first player to start losing, because then you can continue losing by life tapping. And if you life tap and your opponent is trying to play the same game, you often waste their turn because they have to life tap to right. not give you the underdog card. So, you know, minions that do damage to yourself, <laughs> as you do see some playful banter back and forth. You know, cards like Pit Lord, we haven't seen that very often. Is that a really right. good card in this format? Uh, I'm not sure Pit Lord is great. I don't know if I'd have two. I've seen it push for some really nice underdog positions because you take that damage. But in the mid to late game, you want to not actually go down too far. Right. The idea is once you reach like 15, 16, you want your opponent to be like 18 or so. Uh. Because if, if you push yourself down too much because they're playing bursty decks, you just might die from nothing. All right, well, you do see already a little bit of how this format is making the game different, right? Emmett Shear had the opportunity to attack, but he chose not to. So he's, yes, he's opting to try to keep that balance. There's going to be a ahead. ton of not attacking. Yeah. Usually the, the three damage here just means that you don't get a two or a three drop the next turn, or you can otherwise force out a tap from your opponent. So from, from this position, it would seem like you absolutely don't want to attack. You have a five life difference. So in this case, you force your opponent to tap on turn three. It's very cool to see a mix of early and mid-game minions. Like, you don't usually see Mountain Giant and Flame Imp in the same deck together, so... <laughs> yeah, that's it's just, right. It's cool to see how this format affects deck building so much. Here, I believe... Um, oh, man, that Zombie Chow is going to be it. Yeah, there's no good answer for this. Unless you yeah, want to silence, you have to silence the Zombie Chow. That's, a, that's not an easy play to make. Might be the first time I've ever seen this play ever happen. <laughs> You don't want to save your signs for so many other targets. Void Callers, if that Floating Watcher gets out of control. Another cool card, by the way. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, Crip was uh, very astutely pointing out that Floating Watcher was one of the predecessors to Inspire Mechanic, which recently came out with the Grand Tournament. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they have a neutral version of that guy now that I've seen in Constructed, actually. Definitely gotten wrecked by that The Cavaldi card. Raider, right? Yeah, they yeah. innervated it, and I was yeah. dead. It's, it is <laughs> a very menacing card in Arena. It's yeah. better than Floating Watcher because uh, Warlocks don't gain tempo from their hero power, while other classes do, right? Some other classes. Well, I believe we are on uh, Mike Morheim's POV, and... Yeah, Mike is, is a little bit behind. I'm, I'm rooting for him, though. I, yeah, I know you got your CEO. Guy? I, I think I have to root for Emmett here for very obvious reasons. Yes, it's, it's <laughs> important to keep your job. That's, I understand. Yeah. Man's got to pay his bills. 
But I learned that, that Mike, in fact, plays in almost all of his free time uh, Hearthstone. So uh, we actually have two pretty experienced Hearthstone players here. I also heard that Emmett Shear is playing during some business meetings as well. And you're fired. And I'm fired. <laughs> <laughs> was a good run. Yeah. All right, well, um, the board control matters a lot because wow. now with the big threats coming down, you can choose to push for damage. Basically, the attacks, you mean, you're saying that I don't need the underdog bonus. I want to get you a little bit lower so I can finish you off with a burst combo in the next few turns. So he's giving up the underdog to get a little bit of damage on the lead, but he's not pushing for enough damage to give his opponent a creature. Right. So you want to be within that three damage range. Yeah. This is uh, Mike Morheim. He's going to shut down the big game hunter from Emmett Shear. Very wisely choosing to play for that tempo. Setting the 4-2 is also relevant to fight against the board and trade upon it. You can also uh, continue to tap if he feels like it, but uh, mm -hmm. I think he should be okay on the card count, right, right now? Well, he has, he has the option to, uh, to dark bomb the, the zombie chat or him, himself. Um, no, you probably Dark bomb that. yourself! Sometimes that works. Oh, man. We're not trolling, guys. It's definitely one way to do it. Well, I guess just throw out Implosion here. Implosion is a bit of a weird card because it's mostly about board control, and um, in that stage of the game, you kind of want to push for burst rather than board control in the four yeah. or five mana area. Um, so uh, we'll see if that card survives if the, a loss happens here. Ooh, that's a really cheap mountain giant, full hand. Very yeah. wisely, uh, Mike was counting to make sure he didn't overdraw. I, in fact, I didn't count correctly. He would have overdrawn if he mm -hmm. tapped last turn. So how good is the Leroy Power Overwhelming, like, Emperor Thoris and Faceless combo? I think it just uh, Arcane Golem is just more solid than Leroy. It's just good. Okay. Yeah. Because you, you can run Arcane Golem, you can run Abusive Sergeant. Um, I have some experience playing Warlock in this Tavern Brawl, and some of the cards that stand out as weird ones are, like, uh, Dr. Boom seems a little bit weird. It's Like, at that stage in the game, someone's going to lose. Right. And sometimes the move bots, uh, I mean, do you care about the damage that they do to the opponent? Yeah, it could be bad. It could be bad. Could be. And we, have, we have seen zero minion summon, by the way, by this mm -hmm. Tavern Brawl rule, so some people might be just wondering what's going on here. Yeah. Uh, they've been very careful not to lower each other's health. Right, health. right. It's a tie it's crazy in play. Uh, also, uh, cards that seem good, but I haven't seen them be too good, are the Floating Watchers, because again, at that stage in the game, you don't want to tap so much. Right. Uh, the Sacrificial Pact is amazing because everybody is running Voidcaller Malganus. And oh. if you can Sacrificial Pact Malganus and do your burst, it's much better than Big Game Hunter. Because even though you give... Uh, yeah, it, yeah it, it's, you, like, it's okay to gain 5 life if you're killing your opponent. Right. Yeah, and, and it's better cool. than Big Game Hunter because it's, it's a 0 mana removal rather than a 3. So what's been your favorite class in this so far, Pip? Um, Favorite? Well, best is Warlock. Favorite, I have to think about that a little bit. Yeah. Have you tried everything? Have you tried? I've tried most things. Some of the weapon classes have very difficult plays because if you play like Hunter, you can use Glaive Zookas and, and Bows to just take damage while your opponent is playing Flame Imps, so you can keep up with that. Oh, that's really cool. And, and Hunters have Burst as well. So the weapon classes also work. Um, Paladin probably works. They have more weapons but much less Burst, so hard to Well, I'm pretty sure that uh, Mike's going to take a lot of damage here. Oh, well, he's still only four down, which means, uh, you know, Emmett can tap and get within range and make sure he doesn't summon a minion. Seven damage to the face from Dr. Boom. He feels just like playing ladder. Just... Malagos is an interesting yeah. choice. Um, it certainly helps the burst situation, but my experience is that a lot of the games end before turn 10. Like, the issue with Malagos is as good of a card as it is, you really have to get Emperor with it along with the Soulfire. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like a three card combo plus. Mm -hmm. Molens are quite good, just in case some bad stuff happens. Um, Twilight Drakes, though. Hmm. How, how critical is the 10 health here? Is it like danger zone because you know what your opponent can do? Uh, I mean, it, it's, Mike's not even tapping when he plays. Right. It, it seems that both players are running um, fairly tame burst decks. Mm -hmm. So this is actually going to be a bit more back and forth than what I've seen. Um, Generally, you don't see players at 10 life. It's usually the 15 area where one player dies. Mm, gotcha. But this is going to be a little bit different here. So we see from the underdog bonus, he got the 2-1 charger. Chargers are always nice. I believe the most insane creature you can get is an arcane golem as the 3-drop. Sure. You can power overwhelm that and faceless it to just surprise 30 damage from nothing. Wow. Well, yeah. Well, uh, a lot of options here in Emmett's hand. Really tough to decide what to play here. There's a lot of merit to 
probably like Melganis or Emperor. You, you could. Well, let's see. He almost has it with the uh, with the burst, yeah. right? I believe he has uh, eleven. He can't take that damage. Yeah. He's almost dead. He takes too much damage. Yeah, so he actually, he actually can't play Emperor really, and I do think Melganis is too risky. I like this play. All is this right. enough, by the way? It's close. Is there a way for him to get past both taunts and just have the molten attack phase? He does have AoE. I don't, I don't really see it, though. Yeah, I don't see it either. I, I think that siphoning so just maybe like the 3 2 would be the play here. Right, but then siphons will also uh, improve your health, so that way your opponent summons another minion. That's always, also really scary. Yeah, at, at this amount of life, every minion you give your opponent might be your lose condition. Um, I feel like if you do siphon, you have to do something else as well. And you can't really siphon in Hellfire, so it doesn't really work too well. well. You can board clear if you Dark Bomb is 2-3. If you just want to keep the board state uh, as, as much in control as possible. He, he also has hesitated to use the Dark Bomb so far. Right. Um, when he had the option to the minion, just the same as now. He's a little bit lower now, but... Mm -hmm. Um, I think players are starting to realize that they have fairly limited burst, yeah. and they want to save the few pieces of burst that they do have, like Dark Bomb. Sure. So you see, see some hesitation there, but he does end up pulling the trigger. You can oh. definitely come to oh. a situation where... That's that a dangerous yeah. card. Yeah. That, that, that could have been powerful. Let's <laughs> see. Uh, okay, so with the, with the... I think Implosion is okay here. There you go. Okay. Stay on the board here. And drop him from Thor's and just threaten a lot of damage off the board. He still has that Doom Guardian Soul Fire in hand. It's always scary to, to try well, to drop that. He, for the he can combo. actually um, Malago Soul Fire and tap to give Winfrey to the 3 3. Next turn. Oh, that's also pretty sick. Okay, well, uh, the board clear does exist, but you know, it's at the same not time, good. You have to shout up Winfrey Sylvanas to clear the board here, which is terrible. Um, is there another option? I think you kind of have to do that. It's definitely not pretty, though. Uh, also, when, when you Shadow Flame Sylvanas, your opponent is still behind enough hell that he's going to gain board presence yet again because of the Tavern Brawl rules. You could just taunt your Sylvanas and hope for the best. Well, that would be a very hopeful case, I think. Yeah. Very hopeful. There's a lot of useless minions there. And there's going to be another useless minion from the, the behind mechanic. He probably has to... Trade in some of them, though. Mm -hmm. uh oh, Mike's running out of time. Yeah, I think I he's just no gonna make the play. Games. Everything else just seems too risky and too complex. All right, so he clears the board, but what minion's gonna get summoned on the other side? The yeah. <laughs> well, relatively innocuous. All right. Um, well, the Doomguard Soulfire is as much damage as the Malaga Soulfire, which is still not enough. Um, so I think the most aggressive push that you can make this turn would be Juggler and maybe Implosion on your Acolyte. Oh, I like that. And then uh, you summon some minions doing damage to your opponent, yeah. you also draw a card. You're not a fan of just throwing down Melganis? Uh, there's, there's a lot of removal for big cards, but yeah, yeah I guess I guess this works quite well. Yeah, I like this line of play. Alright, well, he's fronting that he can Whoa, kill his opponent. Clockwork, Clockwork. Giant. That's, so, that's a meta call. This is a meta call that you anticipate your opponent playing Warlock and having a lot of hit cards in the hand. Mm -hmm. That would have been genius if he got that earlier. It is, it is better than Mountain Giant if you're against the Handlock. Right. I mean, the Handlocks in this format are playing Flame Imps, Zombie Chows, though. Even then. It's still a very cool card, though. I didn't expect to see that. Mm -hmm. mm, Mike's not happy to see his hand, though. This well, is he, looking pretty bad. He knows he's dead if he... Oh, okay, he can taunt a 9-9, but does that really help that much? Uh, if his opponent doesn't happen to have removal, then maybe, but this could be the victory push for game one for Mehmet. Well, that's the advantage of making that aggressive Malganus play. I mean, it really paid off. Does he have it? Uh, let's see. Well, the Doomguard would add 7, so... No, it's yes. Oh, no, yes, he has. I think you soul fire face and you try not to discard the Doom Guard. And if you don't discard the Doom Guard, you have lethal. All right. If uh, if you can pull that off, then it will be enough. Although it, it is a risk, right? You don't want to discard the Doom Guard here. Well, how do you deal nine? What's the best way to deal nine? That's also tricky. Well, the, the tap makes it less likely, so I think that's still the play. 
He can soul fire for nine, but okay. And he can also drop the molten too. I mean, this is such a big power play from Emmett. He's not gonna go for it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> of course, good thing he his didn't. car's the Doom Guard. Wow, he knows he knows how Hearthstone works. Yeah. The one card you need in a full <laughs> hand, that's the card right. you lose. Is it? Is, but it's still a possibility. What if his opponent summons Doomsayer or something crazy on the other end? Uh, Doomsayer wouldn't trigger. Oh, okay. But that that is a really dangerous card. That's that is the most card, dangerous card. But he can't tap, mm. so. Nope. Okay. That's well, gonna do it. He can't tap. He can't play Hellfire. Both those options kill him, and that's looking like checkmate. And that means Emmett Shiro win game number one here. All right. It certainly seems that way. Oh, the honorable Sudoku. Not bad. Not a bad game at all. Yeah, I think um, I think the strategy was good. Yeah. I think uh, I think both CEOs came in with the the the, the perfect idea here. Right. Uh, I think both their decks are lacking a little bit of burst, <laughs> and maybe maybe yeah. Trump agrees and gives the uh, the yeah. advice that I think they need. Think so. So there it is, Trump W. <laughs> Mike Morheim's in the coach's corner, and Trump's going to make some uh, changes. He can change deck, he can change cards. Mm -hmm. What do you anticipate? Is it good to stay on the Warlock and just try to out your opponent? Because Emmett has to keep on the same deck. I think Warlock is a great choice, a safe choice, but I expect to see cards like <clears throat> Twilight Drake that kind of sat in Trump's hand, not making an impact, get pulled out. So yeah. I'd like to see that replace some more burst. Mm -hmm. Personally, I think uh, just like the burst combo finish is pretty good, the faceless combo. Yeah. I, I'd personally use Leroy because it's very rare to naturally draw the three pieces without Emperor separately. That's the only time Arcane Golem's better. So Leroy is better for two card combos, which you'll have most of the time. And it's also more damage if you draw right. with Emperor. But isn't the Arcane Golem better for one card combos? It just does more damage per mana. Don't you just want more damage per card? How many cards in your deck are going to burst? Yeah, that's the, some of the argument them, because the way uh, I made the decks. But uh, yeah, we'll yeah. See. I think I think there's 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 some uh, consideration That'd for be that. Merit for both, yeah. Yeah, uh, I I also think Morheim may not have been running zombie chows. He went through a lot of his deck and didn't see one. And I think that's that's like as strong of a card as Flame Imp. Yeah, it's a very good point. I mean, he had he had so much trouble with the opposing chow. He had to silence it. Right, and uh, silence is huge when it comes to burst. Silence is basically like in some cases nine damage. Right. Or your way to finish your burst if you need to get past something that's uh, taunting yeah. it in the way. We uh, also, I don't think we saw Sacrificial Pact in his deck either. It seems like uh, the Twitch CEO may have come in with a slightly, slightly more advanced deck. And right. There he is, sitting pretty. <laughs> He's really intense right now, man. He's in the zone. Yeah. His bow tie is very glittery and shiny. <laughs> oh man, Trump's really laying Trump's into yelling. Mike. Mike's like, okay, just stop yelling. <laughs> but you got this. You got this. <laughs> All right, now uh, we can't really see what they're changing either, nor should we probably even talk about it too much here, but uh, I guess we're running out of time. I think there are a lot of changes you can make. I think you can even play a different deck. Yep. Um, we talked about like Freeze Mage at the start, and I think Freeze Mage might actually be a really good deck against this slow of a Warlock. It seems okay. like when I was beating Freeze Mage, it was because like, you know, I was, I was just running every single burst card I could possibly imagine, even like abusive charges and stuff. But you know, Freeze Mage is kind of like that tipping point where um, if you have enough time, you're just going to win every game. Right. And I think against, uh, against Shear's current deck, uh, you might have that opportunity. Do you want to say that uh, in the interest of time, this series is now a best of three instead of best of five. We apologize. I know some people want to see the go to distance, but we will go. So Emmett is effectively on match point. So yeah. Mike doesn't want to lose 0-2. It's not the way to go. Especially not for somebody who uh, plays a lot of Hearthstone, according to him. So Emmett has to stay with that exact Warlock deck, right? Yes, okay. but if Mike wins the next game, then Emmett gets to pull up Coach Trump and try uh, to get match point and then, alter his deck. And then Mike would have to stay with the deck that he won with, right? Correct. So it doesn't make too much sense to make a complete hard counter to that specific Warlock deck. You get deck really here. hard countered. Right, yeah. When you're down mm -hmm. a game, it's not great. So that's uh, really interesting. A lot, of, uh, a lot of strategy here. Mike knows that he has to win two games in a row with uh, whatever deck he ends up building here. I think it's absolutely possible. I think both players played well. I think, um, I think the deck was actually the advantage on the Twitch side this time. Yeah. Um, and I think that's why the win came through. Uh, obviously, the, the good early game hand helped a lot. Uh, I talked about how Flame Imp and Zombie Chows are the only cards you want in the early game, and the rest you kind of draw out in some weird situation. But he had, he had both of those, so uh, yeah, that helps a lot.
Yeah, I agree. And I, I like uh, the direction in which he was able to incorporate things that he anticipates his opponent. For example, Sacrificial Pact, because you anticipate a lot of Warlocks, and you might need it yourself, is also really good. But you know, Mike's in choices were super interesting. The Clockwork Giant being able to come mm -hmm. to the mix. I, I wonder if he got that early game, would that have changed it at all? Perhaps. Um, I would like to see Sacrificial Pact in both decks, just because it counters Malganus and Taunted Demons so well when it comes to the finish. It's not a card you want. It's, it's basically like a silence that you use only to win the game. Sure. So how do you feel about Malganus in the first place? I mean, is that a card worth playing? Do you want that Void Caller package? Do you want to even have targets for things like Big Game Hunter and Silence mm -hmm. and Sacrificial Pact? Or can you just avoid that together and play like Blue Gill Warrior and stuff like that? Maybe you can. Um, Malganus also actually might give you lethal in some situations when it's coming off of a Void Caller. I think you want the Void Callers anyway because of Doom Guard, and you don't want to play Doom Guard by itself because you discard other bursts from your hand that you might otherwise need. Yeah. So do you want Doom Guard though? Because you could be playing like Leroy Double Golem, Double Wolf Rider, That's uh, Urgent true. Horseman. That's true. Uh, you talked about Leroy over Arcane Golem. You didn't sell me, but you're selling me on the oh, Leroy over, yeah. over Doomguard. All right, well, some final words of encouragement from Trump. You know, given all the power of Trump W over to Mike Morheim, he might be unstoppable at this That's point. That's a game face. It's a g <laughs> That's one determined competitor. Emmett Shear does not plan on losing again. Here we go. Tavern Brawl game number two, Battle CEOs. We'll see what class Mike Morheim has prepared for us. All right, it is still a Warlock. Okay. Um, if this is uh, Mike's POV, it looks like he either adapted or actually had the Malagas to start. Yep, uh, Emmett is the one on the coin, so he has the Voidwalk. Voidwalker also seems like a bit of a strange card. Yeah, interesting to see Mortal Coil, too. What does that kill? Uh, just random garbage that spawned from the underdog mechanic, I believe. Okay. I think Mortal Coil is fine. Ooh, he has the Clockwork Giant in the opening hand. That might be really useful. Oh, actually, the, the vo <laughs> we just we just trash talk the, the Void Walker, but here it actually prevents the Zombie Chow from killing itself. That's a very good point. It's actually kind of like the counter to that one specific card that you kind of expect in every deck. Yeah. All right. Well, Flame Imp start here still for him. It's really powerful, but uh, like you said, the Zombie Chow negates it. The Zombie Chow more than negates it because that puts uh, that puts Mike on the life disadvantage oh, and that forces um, forces Sheer to actually uh, have to tap. Yeah, that's right, and that means Mike will continue to get the lead from this point on, and it makes the Clockwork Giant even more powerful because he's forced to tap. Right. Those right, Twilight Drakes are still in there, though. Yeah, I guess we're just gonna see a tap here. Trying to get the biggest Drake possible next turn. Uh, given the option, do you play the Clockwork next turn instead of the Drake? Well, you know yeah, that he's running so. both Silence and Big Game Hunter, but which is more likely to have? Uh, I think you want to get the Big Game Hunter out of the way early because an 8-8 eight, eight on turn 4 is not as threatening as an 8-8 eight, eight when you're at like 15 life. Okay. So if you, if you, you're going to get BGH'd if he has sure. it, and he does have it. So I think you want it to happen as soon as possible. Also, he's forced to play only one of you, so yeah. <laughs> you know, case closed. For those uh, not aware of the Clockwork Giant mechanic, the lowest you can possibly get it down to is two mana, um, I believe. And that's unlikely. That would suggest that your opponent would be overdrawing. So most right. likely it's a three mana in the best case. Right, because it's rare that your opponent holds ten cards and passes to you. Right, it's usually, it's usually in like the mill decks where you give them the cards and then it's two mana, and that's... That would surprise me if there's any mechanic like that here. I've definitely played it in my fair share of aggressive druid decks and naturalized mm -hmm. and cold light oracles when you know I felt like my rank was just a little too high. Yeah. <laughs> uh, never knew what that felt like right now. You have to explain it to me sometime. Well, Emmett's uh, he's gonna be passing here. Looks like because he's not really happy with playing anything. Mm -hmm. He just dies if he trades on board. Right, well, that is a nine-card pass. That is gonna be the basic, the ideal Clockwork Giant play, and he's also gonna be able to tap with it. So that that is very strong. And the big game hunter. Wow, things are looking up. The tap makes it so he can tap again and cast a um, a three-mana mountain next turn if he wishes. I don't think there's any reason to taunt these right now. Oh, well, this is the comeback from Mike Morheim. He has a really powerful board. He doesn't have much burst, though, because uh, you know, we did see Emmett had things like soul fires and mm -hmm. a lot of ways to add I just, damage. I just think the taunt is, like, game-changing when you're almost mm -hmm. dead. And right now at 26, like, you 
don't really care if you get attacked to face, sure. right? In fact, sometimes it might be even helpful if you get your minion on board. I think always it's helpful, actually. Yeah? I don't know, the coin cipher soul is amazing. Um, she refused to actually uh, to use the coin on the uh, Voidwalker early game, and now he's he's forced to play it with a Siphon Soul, which is you know basically right. a wasted turn. It's even a turn where um, if, uh, if if Mike wants to tap here, um, he puts himself in a position where he forces Sheer to tap as well. Right, but at, I think at the same time, if he taps, it gives us the ability to play a Mountain Giant. Don't you want to be playing these big threats too? You do, which is exactly why you should not have played the uh, the, the Sun Fear Protector, I, I think. Ah, uh, but right, uh, you're, what's you're... done is done. I actually still like the tap. I think okay. that's actually better than the Mountain Giant. The Mountain Giant is just you're not you're not really pressing for lethal at this point. Sure. I think in the grand scheme of things, uh, you're absolutely right. Being able to force taps on your opponent gives him less mana to play with on board, and then you can climb ahead that way too. And I think now he has the Owl and uh, Mountain Giant play. He even has the tap Mountain Giant, then Owl. This is a huge swing turn. I really like the tap first, because I think you, you can just afford to. But it looks like he's probably going to play the Flame Imp. It's really interesting that in this format, just because you're so disincentivized to attack with your minions, you're almost never going to get blown out by something like Molten Giant Shadow Flame, which right. is usually game deciding in traditional handlock mirrors. Oh, well, this is another strategy here. You can just take too much damage, so the heal doesn't actually matter. Uh, if he goes, if he plays the flame imp. He will go down to 19, and he'll be healed up to 24, though, when the zombie chow goes in. So yeah, it's not the critical level, but it's still pretty good. It still basically voids the, the zombie chow's effect. Sure. Then he can save the signs for a more appropriate target. These guys are playing so defensively right now, trying to make sure not to lower each other's health pool. It's not really exactly the image you get when you think Tavern Brawl, right? I think here you could have, because you have the mountain on board, you're threatening a lot of burst, you can actually do two face damage of the Sun Fury in this one case. Because you still wouldn't give him the underdog minion and you chip away at his health a little bit lower. That's yeah. kind of the strategy. You want to be the underdog, but you don't want to be the underdog by 15 life because then you're <laughs> going to die, right? You want to be yeah. the underdog by just four, five, maybe six points and you want to maneuver around that as much as you can. Right. Okay, implosion for three, very average result. And Emmett has to figure out what he wants to do from this point on. Doesn't have uh, much mana to play with, so he's just going to tap. He can play the Void Walker just to stall for a little bit of damage and try to fight back on board. He's got that Juggler Implosion for next turn, if that helps at all. That's a strong combo. I'm not sure if any burst was added to these decks. Are you seeing any any cards that we didn't see in the first game, maybe, that would help them out? Malagos was the only one, and Zombie Chow as well. Zombie Chow is mostly just control. Mm. Not burst, but control. There should be another grindy, longer game, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, do you think it's worth clearing the board here with Shadow Flame or just saving it so that way you can play other stuff? Yeah, it, it looks like you can Shadow Flame because this is a turn where you can start pushing for damage. And I think it's appropriate too. You give him the underdog card. Oh, man. But you're threatening so much. I don't know about that attack. <laughs> That's yeah. a lot. That, that second attack makes it so. Molten uh, Shadow Flame. Molten Shadow Flame might be a, a real problem. No Shadow Flame, just the Molten Giant. But he can back it up with uh, some taunts as well. No tap available either for Emmett because he's at full hand, unless he just wants to lower the mana cost. So, what do you do here? You can taunt up both minions, Soul Fire. That seems to be pretty clear, actually. My seal for yeah, your opponent just used uh, Shadow Flame as well, so your board and then you're dead. Here. Those double owls. Oh, he has two owls, you're out. right. Yeah. That's going to be game two, assuming Mike Morheim knows this and sees this, but I, I anticipate that he's got this unlocked. I think down. it's coming down pretty quick. Yeah. yeah. Oh, he's got two owls, two BJ. He's been looking for <laughs> targets all game. <laughs> yeah. Finally got it. And it uh, looks like Mike Morheim fighting back. All right. I mean, that's, that's actually a, a very complicated yeah. finish because uh, he kind of saw the opportunity that Shearer was lacking the removal and he gave him the underdog, uh, the underdog advantage, but he was pushing for lethal in a very tempo-driven way. Right. And uh, th these, are, these are fairly advanced plays when it comes to Hearthstone. Yeah, not bad at all. And uh, we do get one more chance for Trump to show up. And you uh -oh. know what? You know what's a little scary? Trump ultimately decides the winner, right? Because if he could give Emmett some bad advice 
and have him play into <laughs> Mike's deck because he constructed Mike's deck? I don't know. There's some, uh, there, you know, basically, I hope both these guys are on Trump's good side. <laughs> uh, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, I think uh, both these individuals have uh, helped Trump and a lot of us uh, do quite well in the, uh, <laughs> That's the right. game and esports scene. So they yeah. definitely have. I think he has a lot of. Uh, a lot of things to pay back here. I think he's giving Absolutely. good advice all around. Yeah, he taught me what Explosive Trap does when I'm at two health. <laughs> and he's also taught me a lot of stuff about free-to-play decks. I mean, Trump's doing this recent free-to-play priest. Mm. Uh, in the recent times when people say that you want to have all these adventure cards, Trump's doing it by, on a, on a free-to-play account. I think mean, that's really impressive. It is worth pointing out, too, that Trump's decks in this tournament so far have a 100% win rate. So. <laughs> that's right. It's pretty good. 100% win rate. Oh, guaranteed. we actually get this. Sneak oh, peek yeah. at some of uh, Mike's cards there. Well, we don't want to say too much because uh, Emmett is actually right behind us. You don't really see us on camera yeah. in terms of the position, but that's right. not too far away. We almost ruined that. Now, the question is, this, since this is match point for both players, will they switch classes at all? Because they have an opportunity to take advantage of it. Or do you think Warlock's just too dominant and that maybe a few tweaks would ultimately help Emmett go over the top? Um, I think Mike's deck is so anti-Warlock that this actually is a reasonable strategy. Like, um, with, with that much situational cards specifically against Handlock. Sure, sure. Just another class might work better than Warlock here. I mean, one thing I'm not seeing in these decks, at least in the games that we've watched, is any healing. I like the Hunter plan. Okay. Well, that's true. Just get him. There's, Sacrificial there's Pack is, is the healing card. Oh, that's a good point, yeah. Um, Malganis stalls it out, but if, if you're running Hunter, you're running enough silences and stuff to deal with that kind right, of Right, yeah. You're yeah. probably going to have the answer. Yeah. In, in the Hunter deck that I played, I was actually running uh, double lock and load, and I'd run tracking as well, because sometimes you just need that one answer. Mm -hmm. So often the game stalls out enough, and then you get like a crazy lock and load. Just the options are really endless in this Tavern Brawl. It's really a great one. Yeah. That's very cool. Now, uh, keep in mind, guys, we are playing Tavern Brawl. If you haven't played Hearthstone for a while, it is a new format that comes out with crazy set of rules each week. Some of them are pre-made decks. Some of them you have to make decks for themselves. But the cool part is that they give you a free pack every single time right. you play it. I do want to add that if you guys are interested in playing this Tavern Brawl, um, make sure you do so right now, because I believe it's ending tonight or tomorrow. In, in a day and a half, I believe. So okay. somewhere between what you were saying. Um, and then they, get, they queue up a new Tavern Brawl on the following Wednesday. So you definitely want to get in, get your free pack. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's not really free. You have to pay some time. But you're having a good yeah. time, so why not? Looks All like we're right. ready. Game three. And you know this what? This is match point for both players. I think it's once again going to be Warlock versus Warlock. But ultimately, Emmett has the final say because he gets to make his changes after Mike did. Right, right. Um, I feel like uh, both players can kind of account for a lot of burst as well. Mm -hmm. So even if Sheer has a much more bursty deck now than he had before, I still think it's going to be a pretty close game. I think if Emmett wins, he should sub to Trump <laughs> as a thank you. I think if Mike Morheim wins, he should also sub to Trump too. In fact, uh, everyone here who's uh, being able to benefit off of it probably should do that as well. I guess. <laughs> Crip's not amused. <clears throat> All right, well, uh, we see a lot of the same so far. Siphon Soul apparently still makes the cut. Yeah, yeah, just really small changes in these decks. Nothing too drastic. It's still the same strategy, still more or less the same type of play style. Yeah, these guys are really wanting to win. Like, normally, if you're, if you're having fun, you can kind of switch around, take a completely different strategy, see if it works. But these guys, they're, they're not really changing too much, which means mm -hmm. they really want to take this W. All right, well, here, if you tap in the flames, it'd be amazing. No, you don't. OK. So the, du the double Molten might actually be pretty bad. I found that against uh, opponents that had extremely bursty decks, the Molten's actually wouldn't work. Right, and you're not going to attack you anyways, so right. you're never going to have the opportunity right. to play the Molten Giant. So it, it might be a bit of a tricky card. Well, the Flame Imp does exist here, and Ooh. Emmett's evaluating if he wants to drop it or not. Yeah, holding off, to, holding off on playing that's going to let him play the Mountain Giant next turn. So. Mm -hmm. Ah, Ooh. that's a good choice. And the Mountain Giant, much better threat to be able to trade onto the board. Again, the Mountain Giant maybe not attacking the opponent very aggressively, but you know, there's yeah. something like that exists. I actually think the, the Flame Imp was uh, pretty nice there, uh, just because the, the only reason to play the Mountain is to actually bait out the early game Vicky Hunter. Well, it's going to happen. Yeah, that's exactly what's going to happen. <laughs> and maybe uh, both are playing with two big game hunters. So even though uh, oh, he draws another threat. Yeah, there's no way he doesn't play it into that 4-8. Yeah. Way too tempting. 
Okay, so uh, the big game hunter will be able to seize it back, but that's going to free up the rest of, or it's going to lock up the rest of the mana, which means maybe that's an opportunity for Emmett to climb back after this happens. Ooh, I think he has the beast in his sights, unless you want to Drake this time. No, you have to, you have to be Jace, right? Maybe he feels like he wants to save not. the big game hunter because he feels like uh, both drakes kill the gi mountain giant anyways. It would be really mana inefficient to play Drake on almost any other turn, so... Mm -hmm. The logic might be that if I don't play Drake now, I'll never play it. Which makes some sense. Probably right. why Drake's just not me that exact Right, and on Emmett's side, he's like, well, he didn't have the big game hunter, so... Maybe I can play another big threat. Yeah, it's worked out great. And that's a board clear for Mike. He's yep. going to be able to big game hunter the 8 8 and trade into the 8 4 and have a final say or the first day on the board. Yeah, the Clockwork Giants actually surprised me a little bit. Just having more huge threats in the early game seems to counteract the fact that everyone's got big game hunters. Sure. Yeah, we can have two in their deck, right? Right. And Siphon Soul. I mean, you're not and really going to run And That's when you start using pandas. <laughs> that's right. Oh! Apparently, almost. Both of them really have the ability to drop big threats. Sylvanas should be quite nice, though. Also, the tap prevents him from uh, having to tap next turn, which might also be relevant in this game. It's cool to see what a different game it is when neither deck has that much burst. Like, it actually comes down to some pretty complicated board control. Wow. He's really holding on to that BGH. I think he wants to just BGH a taunt down. I, I, that, that is the win condition, but... Ah, okay. um, so saving it yeah. just for the push. Because he can't, he can't attack for 8 anyway. If you attack for 8 here, you kind of give, away your, give, give up your advantage. Sure. Man, these guys are making some pretty elaborate plays around the condition. And right. it's okay because it's three health difference. Even though yep. he was uh, down by five, he's only up by three now. But that's still okay because Mike, Mike is holding the double Molten, so he wants to take this damage right, right. now. Right, that's also a good point. All right, so you just have to play around seven points of burst. It's a pretty dangerous number. All that is a soul fire and a hell fire. And I dead. cannot imagine a play that isn't clockwork BGH here. How about a side? I don't know. You're not getting a better clockwork, and you're not getting a much better BGH than that. It's true. Uh, you're, you're, most likely, your opponent's going to try to play a little bit more cards onto the board, but at the same time, in its hand, he's not going to drop. Uh, too much here, because mm -hmm. if he taps, he's gonna. Moments. Yeah, if he, if, he, if he taps, he's gonna be overdrawing. Unless he's gonna soul fire. He also takes a little bit more damage. Really like this. How carefully well, he, is not to fall behind. If he, if he, taps, by he has the soul fire face, which is terrible, because he has a ten cards if he tapped. Right. Also fire his own void caller. That may not be that bad actually with his hand. All right, it's a clockwork giant time. So I, perhaps Mike thinks that the best way to fight back onto the board is more of a defensive approach when he needs the giant as opposed to taking the initiative and not having the ability to attack anyways. Because mm -hmm. sometimes if you play the giant on the board and there's nothing on it, your opponent will just remove it versus you can play the giant here and then have your opponent play it while you have the opportunity to play more cards. I like the silence here. It prevents some really bad stuff from happening. The, the tap seems a little scary, but I think if you don't tap, you're playing both the one drop. So I, I guess you just... Go for it. Yeah, throw him out. Yeah, and you also lower your health too, so that way maybe you can yeah, summon him. Yeah, that's pretty low right now. Uh, in fact, he might have it. I think Soulfire Doomguard is enough to take the Oh, game. well, there is a chance that the Soulfire discards the Doomguard though. Oh. Uh oh. Emmett, does he have to see it? Because he does have six damage on board, plus the four from the Soul Fire and the Doom Guard. That's 15 damage. Yeah, if, if you do go for lethal, you oh, Okay, he sees it. But nine. in order to do it, he has to make sure not to discard the it's one, a one in nine. nine. So, 11% chance to just miss it. It's at least 50%. All right. Oh. Yeah. That's going to seal the deal. Wow. Oh, this is point three cards to face. You know what? Trump has a 100% win rate still. Yeah. I still don't know what he changed. <laughs> Most of the it, it's, it's mostly yeah. the moral support, the really, chows. I think. Zombie chows. Oh, the zombie chows helped, yeah. yeah. Crowd really going wild here. As Emma Shear, at least for today, is the better CEO at Hearthstone. But you know what? They have another opportunity to play in the future. I'm sure they'll be able to add each other on Battle.net and settle this off screen. We're going to toss it to Rachel and have a couple of words with the CEOs. Thank you so much, Dan. Thank you to our casters. Let's give it up for Kriparian, Raynad, and Frodan.
Now, gentlemen, we had a heck of a match up here. And, uh, Mike, you know, usually I don't get to do loser interviews, so I'm not going to let this opportunity go to waste. I actually want to know, you felt confident. Emmett came out here with a swagger. What happened? You know, I didn't get the cards that I've been getting the last two days in practice. So, but uh, he played well, and, you know, it was, he, I put, thought I put up a decent fight, but... I would say you absolutely put up a decent fight. Now, uh, Mr. Morheim here says he put two days, eh, two days of practice in. How much preparation did you do for this event, Emmett? The, the instant this tavern brawl came on, I, I started playing. I think people at work can report that I was playing perhaps at work also. I felt, I felt deep need to, uh, to prepare for this matchup because I knew Mike would be a fierce competitor. And uh, I have to say, from my, my takeaway from this match is that the Trump advantage is real. Uh, <laughs> Why don't we give it up for our champion of the Battle of the CEOs, the CEO of Twitch, Mr. Emmett Shear. And you can keep that going for both of our competitors, Mr. Mike Morheim, CEO and President of Blizzard. And thank you, Emmett, for a wonderful event, a wonderful TwitchCon. Thank you all for watching. Coming up next on this, oh wait, thank you to Trump. Let's give a little round up here for Trump. The Trump effect is real. You can stand next to your champion, take a little credit there. And for the rest of you, we have the finals of PJ Salt coming up next. Don't leave your seats. Those are hot spots. We'll be right back.